keeping it real. Real how we keep it. Get ready for Eddie. Greetings of peace. Welcome to the Dean Show. How you guys doing? Exciting episode every week. If you're like most people, you have no idea. Yeah, you hear it on the news. We've covered it before. Military occupations are meant to be temporary, but after 40 plus years, this one looks permanent and entirely unjust. In the West Bank, Israeli Jewish settlers and Palestinians live on the same land, but must live under two completely separate and unequal systems of Israeli law. The Jewish settlers dominate the natural resources, including water and agricultural land, and they're backed by the Israeli army. To maintain the occupation, Israel has demolished thousands of Palestinian homes and orchards, confiscated Palestinian land, bombed a captive civilian population in Gaza, and punished resistance with raids, arrests, and assassinations, all to gain maximum land while making life so difficult for Palestinians that they will either leave or be too afraid to resist. Palestinians have fought back. For decades, they tried to achieve national liberation through armed struggle. Some groups still do. But the majority now support popular protest instead. The deeply harmful pattern of control, repression, and violence profoundly harms Palestinians living under occupation and Israelis living as occupiers. This must be broken to reach a peaceful and secure future for both peoples. Now that you understand the problem, what about the solution? What about peace talks? So far, over two decades of U.S.-backed peace talks have actually made things worse by helping Israel continue the occupation. It's been years of talking while Israel massively expanded the Jewish settlements and literally redrew the map. Peace talks are good if they're real, but not when they're theater to cover a land grab. So now what? The current world superpower, the United States, has been a terrible friend, enabling Israel's destructive and self-destructive expansion onto Palestinian land by funding the Israeli military, the biggest recipient of U.S. foreign aid in the world. But there's another superpower that can make the difference, you. And we have an expert in the area, but like most people, you have no idea. You hear Israel, you hear Palestine, things blowing up up there, and you're like watching Family Guy, and I have no time for that. These, are these Muslims really trying to extinguish all the Jews from the face of the earth? How do we know what's true, what's false? So we're gonna be clearing up some misconceptions, getting to the bottom of this with an expert. We've had him on the show before. Miko Pillet, get this, his father was an Israeli, he's my friend, Miko, father was an Israeli general, his great-grandfather, one of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence, so we got no fool on the show, we have an expert, we'll be right back. Keeping it real, real how we keep it, get ready for Eddie, set back the beat show. We encourage people to come to us, ask. Welcome back to the Dean Show. Guess who? My friend, your friend, Miko. Feel it. How are you, Miko? How you been? I've been great, thanks. It's good to see you again. Good to see you also. Can you kind of summarize? Did I hit it right? Your father was a general in the Israeli army. Your, grand, your grandfather, I said it's like, can you compare him to like a George Washington? One of the founding fathers. Founding fathers. Found, yeah. Can you go ahead and elaborate on that? Yeah, founding fathers. So my uh, my maternal grandfather was one of the signers of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. He was one of the early Zionists. Uh, he was a leader of the Zionist movement within the Zionist movement. Um, so yes, this is uh, I come from a pretty patriotic uh, family. I have to say yes. Now for the people taking a break from the sitcoms from the nighttime, daytime drama, and they want to get into some history, some current events. But like most people, we're just ignorant about what's going on. But there's nothing wrong with, you know, if you're, if, if, if you're trying to learn so you can overcome that ignorance, right? You want to you wanna grow, you want to learn. And we have a Israeli 
Jew, uh, Jew, Jewish Israeli here, someone who's an expert, scholar in this area, to educate us, to educate me, to educate you. So give us like a summary. What's the whole, for the average person has no idea, what is going on over there? Why are things just blowing up? Why are, you know, and then you have this term, just terrorists, you know, are over there, we're trying to, you know, all, all, all the common mantra that's going on. Can you just in a nutshell, like summarize, bring people up to speed, how this started, what's going on? I know you can talk on this for, for days, but in a nutshell, for your common person, average person who just has no clue? Well, I think, uh, I think it's important to limit ourselves to Palestine. And so that's what I do. Um, not to try to overextend and try to understand every single conflict in the Middle East and every single place and to bunch them all together. So I'm going to focus on Palestine, which is what I do. Um, it's what I know, it's what I understand. And the, the issue of Palestine is really actually quite simple. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story of, uh, of uh, colonization. It's a story of oppression. It's a story of ethnic cleansing and genocide. Uh, to which the Palestinians have been victims for 70, 80 years now. And the colonizers and the oppressors, um, contrary to what people seem to think or what people say in mainstream media, are the Israelis, are the Jewish immigrants who came to Palestine, like my grandparents, who came at the turn of the last century, came to colonize Palestine, came to establish a uh, European state in land that belonged to the Palestinians, Arab Muslim land. Um, and that is really the beginning of the story. That is really why there is a conflict. That is really why there is a problem. Um, naturally, Palestinians tried to resist. So when they tried to resist the oppression, when they tried to resist the confiscation of their land, they are called terrorists. Um, and this kind of fits in with today's, um, you know, with today's um, demagoguery and mythology that, that, that demonizes Muslims and demonizes Arabs. Uh, but the reality is that for 70 um, years, more than 70 years now, Palestinians have been victims of, of terrorism, they've been victims of genocide, they've been victims of ethnic cleansing. And today all of Palestine is governed by a single government, which is the Israeli government. Um, it's not a democratic government unless you're an Israeli Jew. If you're a Palestinian, you live under a completely different set of laws. It's more like an apartheid regime than anything else. And Palestinians are resisting and they have a right to resist. And most of the time they resist using nonviolent means. Most of the time they try to use diplomacy or they try to use nonviolent means of resistance like BDS, boycott, divestment, sanctions, and so forth. Um, and using whatever means at their disposal. From time to time they do engage in armed violence. Um, and that is the reality and, and they are always met by terrible violence from the Israelis. Israel has a huge army. It is well equipped, equipped by the US, with the latest technology, the latest warplanes, the latest tanks, the latest um, uh, artillery. And Israel uses it predominantly against uh, Palestinian civilians. So that, in a nutshell, is the problem. That is, in a nutshell, is what is happening in Palestine. And it's really, relatively speaking, quite simple. It's not, uh, it's not an easy problem. It's not an easy thing to fix, perhaps, but it's really quite simple. What about for, for many of the people who say that, look, Israel loves freedom, unlike their neighbors. Uh, Arabs want to wipe us out, right? Um, and, and, and many other things that are said that, look, the people there uh, want to live in peace, but it's the Arabs, you know, the Muslims, who are just trying to wipe us out. And this is our instinction. They try to do it before, they try to do it now. They're the ones that are sending the bombs over, they're trying to blow us up. What do you say? Well, it's factually not true. There's absolutely no evidence, no truth at all to any of those statements. Um, the Palestinians were the, and still are the victims, of a cruel campaign of ethnic cleansing. The reason today we have about 5 million refugees living, Palestinian refugees in refugee camps, that have been there for almost seven decades, is because of the ethnic cleansing campaign that Israel engaged in when it was established in 1948. It was a long and cruel, uh, campaign that lasted uh, more than a year, where Palestinian towns were wiped out, wiped off the face of the earth, Palestinians were forced out of their land and into refugee camps. Uh, many massacres took place, many innocent civilians were killed by the Israeli forces. So there's absolutely no proof 
no evidence that supports any of those claims that the Arabs or the, the Palestinians want to wipe Israel off the map, that the Palestinians want to kill it. I mean, there's no evidence, and it's never happened. You know, what did happen is seven decades of what I call an attempted genocide, because when you kill innocent civilians by the thousands, as Israel has been doing, when you deport Palest people by hundreds of thousands, as Israel has been doing, when you deny millions of people the right to return to their homes, when you deny people water, Palestinians, even though they're the majority of the population in Palestine, under Israeli control, um, are allocated only 3% of the water. Well, denying people water is a sure way to kill them, other than shooting them. Um, and so none of these claims are, are based in fact. When we actually look at the facts, we see that Israel has been uh, the aggressor, and the Palestinians have been victims, and yet Palestinians are still quite willing and quite interested in peaceful coexistence. Now, from from the perspective, I mean, I'm, I'm a Muslim, you're Jewish, Israeli, and this myth a lot of times is perpetuated that, you know, Islam teaches, you know, the hate of Jews, but historically, is that true? I mean, from, from the Islamic perspective, you see, like, you know, the the Quran honoring, you know, you have 34 times mentioned, you know, this honor, the people of the book. You have Moses, who is his, one of the greatest messengers ever sent to mankind. He's, he's uh, the greatest messenger in the Old Testament. In Islam, he's mentioned over 136, 136 times. You had the Medina Charter, where Jews were given safety and they were given uh, protection. So do they, do people know this? Do they know these facts? You know, there is a professor, I believe from the, uh, uh, the journal, JC Journal, I know, da uh, David Warrenstein, where he said that Islam had saved the Jewish people. I mean, when, you know, do, do people know these things? Do they know that, you know, uh, these facts are out there? Um, well, I think I told you this before. I was born and raised in Jerusalem. And although I was raised in a part of Jerusalem that was predominantly Israeli, um, Arab East Jerusalem was just, you know, a couple of miles away. And Arab East Jerusalem is a deeply Muslim city. And my impression growing up of Islam is, is, is uh, from what I saw in Jerusalem. And it was an impression of great beauty, of kindness, of hospitality, of warmth, uh, honesty, sincerity. That is, you know, the beauty of hearing the uh, call to prayer, you know, from the mosques, from the minarets everywhere in Jerusalem. Um, uh, acceptance. That's that was my impression of just as being, you know, being a young man and a kid growing up in Jerusalem and and and, and knowing uh, Arab East Jerusalem, particularly the old city. Now, historically, Jews have lived in Arab countries and Muslim countries very well and very peacefully and thrived. Jewish communities all over the Arab world, all over the Muslim world, thrived. Um, when Jews, and many times when there were persecutions of Jews, there was persecution of Jews in Christian Europe, they found safe havens in the Arab world, they found safe havens in the Muslim world. And I think religiously too, theologically too, the, the Islam and Judaism are sister religions, really. They share more in common than most other, than any, almost any other two religions that you can think of. And so, uh, the, n n again, none, none of these, none of this uh, violent and um, intolerant image of Islam is based on facts, particularly not when we're talking about relations between Jews and, and Muslims, and between Jews and Muslim, the Muslim world. None of this is, none of this is based in fact. In fact, facts point the opposite. And when we talk to Jews, old Jewish people and Muslims who lived in cities in Palestine before the State of Israel, before Zionism came, we're talking about people who lived in Jerusalem, some of the neighborhoods, uh, in the old city, uh, in Hebron, and some of these older cities where Jews and Muslims lived together for you know hundreds and hundreds of years. The stories are always stories of tolerance. The stories are always stories of people getting together, respecting one another. Uh, often, uh, Jewish, older Jewish people will tell you how on the Saturday, the day of Sabbath, their Muslim friends wouldn't smoke out of respect for, or wouldn't light fires out of respect for the Jews who on that day do not smoke and light fires, you know? And similar stories, you know, during Ramadan where Jews would respect the, 
you know, the wishes and the, and the feelings of, of their Muslim neighbors. Those are the stories that you hear from people who really lived uh, were in, in these mixed communities. And then if you want to talk about stories of um, Jews and Arabs, Jews and Muslims who lived in proximity in Baghdad, in Yemen, in North Africa, in all of these other uh, Muslim cities and Muslim countries, the stories are always stories of tolerance and great friendship and great uh, neighborly relationships. None of that other stuff is uh, ever happened. You know, none of that other stuff is, is true, and like, like I said, none of it is, is is based on on fact or history. How true is this? When you study, is this something documented? It's I had co I had quoted the um, the professor uh, David Warrenstein, who mentions this in that in that journal. And you have other prominent rabbis who come out. Uh, I've had uh, my friend uh, Rabbi Weiss. You know Rabbi Weiss. They substantiate this also, and, and this kind of like you know. Uh, it brings down some of those barriers and walls and, and clears that great misconception like, you know, Muslims hate Jews. But, I mean, it's a fact now, bef before um, uh, history shows, there's also another example. The, tell me if you know about this, you can elaborate on it. The Albanians, at the time when they were, um, the Jewish people were being, uh, World War II, uh, Hitler was, was uh, persecuting and, and killing uh, the Jewish people, that the Albanians were making documents and saying these are our people that you were not going to touch. Do you know? Um, can you elaborate on that? I don't. I can't elaborate. I have heard about it, but I don't know the details. Yeah. But but the stories of Jews finding refuge among Muslims, uh, even within Europe, not just going out into Muslim countries, but even within Muslim communities, even even in Central Europe, even places like France, where 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 Jews found refuge in in, in mosques, and and certainly in other Muslim countries, this is well known and it's well documented. Absolutely. So what happened? How do, you know, the neighbors who were together, you know, I heard they would watch each other's kids. It, it was, we have a long, rich his, history of, of peace. What happened? Well, what happened is colonialism. What happened was intervention by European powers. What happened was the uh, colonizing of Palestine by uh, Europeans. Um, and then they change the narrative. You know, the conqueror, the the conqueror always, always, always gets to write the history. And so the stories that they invented were stories of uh, that that or stories that perpetuated this image of the Muslims and the Arabs as uh, irrational and violent and uh, uneducated and incapable of living together with others and uncivilized and so on. And all of this to justify the conquests, to justify this new order that the, that the, that the Zionists brought to Palestine and that the Europeans after World War I created in the Middle East. Um, in, order to, in order to maintain um, colonized reality, a colonized project, you have to justify why you are oppressing the other. You have to justify why you're kicking the other out of their homes, why you're killing them, why they're arresting them. You have to justify it somehow. So the way you justify it is by creating myths, by creating a different story. Now, some 70 years later, go back and start telling people that it wasn't the Arabs of Palestine that were attacking the Jewish community, it was the other way around. It was the Jewish community in Palestine, the Zionist community, who came fully intending to ethnically cleanse the land and, and you know take the and take over? They, they came fully intending to destroy Palestinian towns and destroy Palestine as an Arab Muslim country and take over and create this European uh, colony there, which is what Israel is. So you, you, have, you have 70 years of, of this of this mythology that has been perpetuated here in the West. It's been perpetuated here in the United States. When you look at uh, school books here in America, history school books. What do they say about the Middle East? What do they say about the ancient Middle East? All of these stories perpetuate this myth that today's Jews, um, today's Israelis are the descendants of the ancient Hebrews. You know, even now, um, after the United Nations passed this resolution condemning Israel for building settlements in the West Bank, the Israeli Prime Minister, the Israeli ambassadors are going back and saying, we lived there, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years ago, and so on and so forth, which is all mythology, you know. None of us European Jews are descendants of the ancient Hebrews. It's, you know, it's a complete myth. But the story is perpetuated. The story is told very well. It's a good story. It's a story that's easy to accept. And they're very good at telling it. They're very good at, at, at pushing their agenda and pushing their mythology to justify their agenda. 
that's what happened. So people lose track of what actually took place. Now we're not, again, talking to some layman. This is my friend, Miko Pillet, the general's son. Father was a general in the Israeli army, great-grandfather, great, uh, great, uh, grandfa uh, uh, one of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence. We got an expert in this area. Miko, do you get a lot of heat speaking up for the oppressed? Do you, do you, do you have a lot of backlash because of your strong voice for justice? Uh, to be honest, no, I don't. Uh, not at all. I mean, I get invited to speak where I get invited to speak. I, I you know, I, I, I don't suffer any backlash at all. Quite the opposite. I meet wonderful people. I make great friends like you. Um, and not at all. I think this has been a, this has been a great reward speaking. And I don't really feel that I speak for the oppressed. I feel that I speak for my friends, my Palestinian friends who are living under very harsh conditions. But when you know Palestinians, even in the most harsh conditions, Palestinians who live in Gaza where they're denied water and food and, and there's malnutrition, you know, for the first time in Palestine and Gaza and things like this. I look at my friends, I look at people that I know, I speak to them. There's nothing oppressed about them. They're, they're, they are uh, strong and, and their spirit is strong even though they're suffering a great deal. If you had a chance to sit with Larry King, I don't know if you've ever met Larry King, and you got into a discussion with him, how do you think he would respond? And then what would you say to the term institutional discrimination? You heard this term, institutional discrimination. And how do you think the conversation would go between you and Larry King? Well, I was born and raised in a country that, that has institutional racism. The state of Israel is, an institution, is based on institutional racism, institutional discrimination of favoring Israeli Jews like myself over Palestinians who are the natives of the, of the land. Uh, where I was born and raised, and where I, when I'm in Jerusalem, where I live, is a completely different reality, uh, both legally in terms of the laws that govern my life, the environment, the amount of water that I get, the opportunities that I have. It is completely, completely different in, in a way that is privileged than Palestinian friends of mine who live sometimes no more than, you know, 10, 15 minutes away. So institutional racism and institutional discrimination is the basic foundation of the state of Israel. So I was born, I was raised with that. I've seen it all my life. Living in America, there's also, I mean, America wrote the book about institutional racism. America was, 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 was established um, on the foundation of genocide of the native people and then slavery. And there is no worse institutional racism and discrimination than slavery. And of course, the, the reality of, of, uh, of blacks in this country and people of color in this country has always been one of, of institutional racism. So in a way, every country I've always ever lived in almost has been, you know, has had institutional racism as part of its reality. What are the common um, responses to what you're saying? And then how do you respond to those? Well, the common, the common comments are that Palestinians are terrorists and Israel has no choice but defend itself. The Jews somehow have some kind of a historical right and a moral right to take over Palestine and create a Jewish state, even if that means infringing upon the rights of Palestinians because Jews have some kind of a special case because of the Holocaust and so forth. Um, you know, I think it's really quite simple. Uh, it's a question of values. If you believe that one person has more rights than anyone else because of their race, their religion, their color, their nationality, their gender, whatever. If you believe that one life is more valuable than another. Um, I remember after the massacre in Gaza in 2008, 2009, it's called, the Israelis called it cast lead. Um, I was in Palestine during the time and then I came back to the U.S. and I was giving talks about it and after a certain talk, I think I was in San Diego and members of the Jewish community came up and criticized me for speaking up like this and criticizing Israel. And I said to them, if you think that um, it's okay to kill a child, if you think it's okay um, to drop bombs on innocent civilians, then there's really nothing to talk about because the conversation is over. It's a question of values. You know, if you asked me, I would tell you, even if the devil himself lived in Gaza, it wouldn't justify harming a single hair of a Palestinian child in Gaza. 
And now you're telling me it's okay to kill civilians and kill children because there's this thing in Gaza called Hamas. It's a question of values. There's nothing to argue about. You either think it's okay to drop bombs on civilians and kill children, or you think it's wrong. There's no justifying it. There's no gray area here. It's the same with racism. You either believe you're either racist or you're not, or you oppose racism. There's no gray area here. So my response to people who come up with these claims, who say, you know, whether they're saying that, you know, blacks deserve less, or that Muslims are terrorists, or the Palestinians uh, have no rights, or the Jews have more rights than Palestinians, it doesn't really matter how it's framed. It all stems from the same racist beliefs. Well, if somebody has racist beliefs, that's their values. There's really nothing to argue about. If you believe that this is right, that's the end of the conversation. It's not politics. So that's why I said earlier, it's really a very simple reality. It's really a very simple situation. Um, and if you look at your values and you examine your values, it's going to tell, it's going to show you which way to go. You know, it's really quite simple. And my values point me in one direction, and obviously other people's values point them in a different direction. And there's nothing to argue about. Give us a, a live story because the people there have been dehumanized. So put some, put a human face to it. I mean, from a live experience. And if somebody, be it a Christian be it uh, an Israeli, a Jew, wanted to go over and meet some Palestinians to make that human connection, which is so powerful. You know, share with us some real stories, you know, uh, that people can, can, can that, that good from every human can come out. And because that dehumanization has really um, taken, blinded a lot of people. Well, it seems perfectly natural to me because I'm, when I'm in Palestine, I'm with Palestinians all the time. You know, I sleep, uh, I go to sleep at friends' houses where Palestinians and Palestinian towns and Palestinian villages and, 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 and cities and uh, Ramallah and Abi Saleh and Bilain, I mean, places that are in Palestine all the time. I sleep in their homes, I eat with their families, I, we, we sit in all night and we talk about things, uh, we sit in a big circle in the village and, you know, drink tea and discuss politics. I mean, uh, this is something that I do and, and all the time. And it's interesting to, to talk about Palestinians as being as, as less than human or being savages, across the street we have Israeli settlements, Jewish towns that steal their waters, that sit on the land of these Palestinians, of this Palestinian village, that take the water of these Palestinian people, that have served in the army that arrests them and shoots them, and often arrests and shoots and tortures their children. Yet the Palestinians are, are called uh, inhumane or savage or terrorists, uh, and they've never engaged in violence. They've never, they never had an army. They've never, there's never been a Palestinian army. There's never been a Palestinian tank. You know, so so to me, it's perfectly natural. I do this all the time. I mean, I'm in, I'm I'm with Palestinians in their homes, in their towns, in their villages, in their cars, in, in cities, everywhere, and all the time. Um, and all I ever experience is, is, is friendship and kindness and warmth or, you know, indifference. I'm just another person who's coming and going and doing, doing whatever I do. Uh, we just had a conference, a wonderful conference, uh, last month in November uh, in the village of Nabi Saleh. Um, so there were Palestinian speakers, I spoke, there was a group of people who came from the U.S. Some of the people who came from the U.S. had never been to Palestine, so this was their first, their first trip. Um, you know, every night we sat together, we talked, and, and so on, till late in the to late in the you know, night. Uh, we stayed in Ramallah for a few days. It, it was, it's, 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 it's an excellent, it's a wonderful experience. I encourage everybody to go to Palestine and visit Palestine and and travel in Palestine. It's very easy to travel. It's inexpensive. It's friendly. Uh, you're always going to find somewhere to eat and somewhere to sleep and 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 and, and a friendly face. Uh, and that is the reality of Palestine. And people who do go to Palestine, who do get involved with um, the struggle for justice in Palestine always come back with the same impressions of how kind and warm and friendly and, and, and you know, easy to travel and so forth uh, Palestine is and, and Palestinians are as a people. I'm trying to ascertain the truth and we have the son of Israeli General, my friend Miko Pillet here helping us to remove much of this ignorance on what's going on over there. And tell me, Miko, how much money is actually spent here? Our 
tax dollars are sent over there and what is it is it to, to help the poor what, what's going on with the money that's sent you know because we got a lot of uh, you know people here who you know we got towns in, in, in America that are upside down and uh, we can use some money here but what's we what, what the taxpayer wants to know what's going on with our money over there well, Israel gets the largest foreign aid, pack, foreign aid package from America than any other country, and Israel is not a developing nation. Israel doesn't need foreign aid. It doesn't deserve foreign aid, doesn't need foreign aid. It's a wealthy country with a strong economy. So why is it that the U.S. gives billions and billions of dollars to a country that doesn't need it every single year is a mystery. You know, it's a question that every American taxpayer has to ask because these are American tax dollars going there. Um, what the money is used for is, is uh, to purchase weapons and uh, kill Palestinians. It's as simple as that. The Israeli army is huge, it's uh, well equipped, and the only, the, really the only people that, that suffer are the Palestinians, and they suffer directly from this foreign aid. Now besides the foreign aid, besides all this taxpayer money that goes to Israel, there are tax-exempt organizations that support the Israeli military, that support Israeli settlements, that support all kind of groups uh, within Israel, Jewish groups that go in and steal Palestinian land and take Palestinian homes. And we're talking about billions and billions of dollars on top of the foreign aid. Uh, we're talking about money that comes in um, and from, from, from tax-exempt organizations, American tax-exempt organizations. So they're exempt from tax, but they're using the money in order to support settlers, in order to support terrorizing Palestinians, in order to support the Israeli army even more. Um, uh, and uh, President-elect Obama's uh, son-in-law is one of them. They, he's, he's, uh, he's on the board of the Friends of the IDF. And they give millions and millions and millions of dollars to the Israeli military which I believe is no more than a glorified terrorist organization. So why is it okay for them to give material support to the IDF, um, which again is material support to an organization that, that is engaged in terrorism, and whereas the Palestinians who give charity to Palestinians and do not give it to any kind of military organization but give to charity, are accused of, of, of giving material support to terrorism. This is a double standard here that is, that is impossible to understand. But there's a reality here in America that says that Israelis are poor and they deserve money, and I don't know why that is, and it's, it's time to end it. Because number one, American taxpayer money is going to do terrible things, which makes Americans complicit in some terrible crimes. And number two, these tax-exempt organizations are not paying taxes and they're sending millions of dollars to do very bad things. So why are they getting well, why are they getting a tax exemption? Why is the US missing out on all this again millions and millions of dollars of money that should be paid in taxes? Um, and again, it's a vicious circle that needs to be brought to an end and somebody's got to stand up and say, we don't agree to this anymore. We're not going to give any more money to Israel. Israel doesn't need it, doesn't deserve it. And besides, they're using the money to do terrible, terrible things. Can you uh, explain to us what's going on with the, with the settlers moving in? Well, it's actually a lot more simple than that. Um, all Israelis are settlers. We all came from somewhere and took Palestinian land. If not us personally, then you know our parents or grandparents. So all Israelis are settlers and they're all sitting on Palestinian land, stolen Palestinian land. Um, usually when they talk about settlers in, that, in this context, they talk about the settlers who did the, say, the exact same thing, took Palestinian land and are living on it in the West Bank, which is a small part of Palestine that Israel occupied in 1967. You see, the occupation of Palestine took, took place in two parts. The larger part of Palestine, 80% of it, was occupied in 1948 when Israel was established. And then the smaller part of it, which is the West Bank, was taken over 20 years later. So it was a two-part process. And for some reason, only the Israelis, only the Jews who live in the West Bank are called settlers. The reality is we're all, all Israeli are settlers. All Israeli towns and cities are illegal settlements and should all be uh, treated as such. Um, so, but, but that's what Israel does. Israel is a settler colonial um, in a state. It's a settler colonial country. It's a settler colonial project. It's all about taking the land away from the population to whom it belongs, the native population were the Palestinians, and allowing Jewish immigrants to take over, Jewish settlers to take over. This is what happens all over Palestine, all over the country. And of course people call it Israel. I refuse to call it Israel. I think we should call it Palestine, which is what the country is called. Um, but that is what takes place everywhere. Palestinians are being kicked off their land, 
so that uh, Jewish towns can be built for Jews only. You know, we're talking about exclusive, exclusively Jews being, uh, you know, being allowed to live on the land, to use the land, uh, to build roads on the land, and so on and so forth. And according to Israeli law, um, the vast majority of the country uh, can only be sold or leased to Jews. Nico, before we come to, to a close, to an end, this wonderful session with my good friend Miko Pillard, the general son. You got to get the book. Well, we'll um, tell us. Uh, the, there is no such thing as Palestine, Palestinians, there are people coming from the outside. We've been here 3,000 years. What do you have to say about this? Well, I don't know who's been anywhere 3,000 years. <laughs> I don't think any of us live that long. Uh, the story of somehow the today's Jews, and particularly today's Israelis, are somehow the descendants of this ancient tribe that lived in, you know, that lived there 3,000 years ago, the ancient Hebrews. Uh, there's no proof, historical proof, that that's true. There's certainly uh, no reason to expect that it's true. I think if you look at the color of my skin and the color of the skin of most Israelis, you'd realize there's no way that we're descendants of anyone who lived in that region. You know, we're Europeans, we're whites, and I think it's pretty obvious. How we ended up Jews may be an interesting story for another time, but obviously we're not descendants of the ancient Hebrews. Um, nobody's been there for 3,000 years. There are small Jewish communities that have been in Hebron and in, um, and in a place like Jerusalem and a few other small cities, very small communities that have been there for a very long time. I don't think anybody's been there 3,000 years. Um, but it's part of the mythology that, that justifies the so-called return or the emergence of the Zionist state, the state of Israel, that justifies the colonialism of Palestine, the colonizing of Palestine, justifies the ethnic cleansing, and of course, here we are again, back to this narrative where the Jews are a righteous people that have a right to return to Palestine, the Palestinians or the native people of the land have no right to live there, and it's okay to kill them and arrest them and, and force them into exile. Um, it's just one more component of this of this mythology. And maybe just to wrap it up, you know, the entire Zionist ideology is based on three myths. The first myth is that Jews are a nation, as opposed to being a religious group within other nations. So you could have Jewish Germans, Jewish uh, French, Jewish Yemenites, Jewish Moroccan, Jewish and so forth, and Iraqi. The second myth is that the Bible is a history book. And we heard this again said now by the Israeli ambassador, by Netanyahu many times, and other Israelis, that the Bible is a history book that proves the Jews deserve Palestine. Well, the Bible is not a history book. It's a book of faith. It's a religious document. But the Zionists, who are, never believed in God and are, were completely secular people, said that the Bible is the history book of the Jewish people. The third myth is that Palestine is the, Jew, the homeland of the Jews. And everything else rests upon these three myths. And everything is justified by falling back on these three myths, and everybody seems to treat them as though they were true. Um, so I think it's important to have that in perspective and realize these three myths are myths. They are not true. They were created by the Zionists in order to justify what they do. And if we understand that, then we understand why things are the way they are today. Okay, you, you see, you see this happening. The world sees it happening. What about uh, the international community? What, what's the human voice, global voice, saying, doing? How can people who who want to stand up for justice? How can they make a, a, a peaceful protest against this? Uh, the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. The BDS call. It is a call by Palestinian civil society to the world, providing all of us all people of conscience with a pathway to resist the oppression of Palestinians and to bring about justice for Palestinians. Um, it's a very dedicated, very principled, non-violent form of resistance. Um, South Africans will tell you that BDS brought down apartheid in South Africa. I truly believe that BDS will be maybe not the uh, force, but certainly one of the major forces that's going to bring down the racist apartheid regime in Palestine and will help to free Palestine. So in every country, in every community, um, people of conscience need to find the BDS uh, group, the BDS branch, and if there isn't one, to start one, go on bdsmovement.org and, and, and take a look at what they do. 
They have had campaigns now, very large and very, very, very successful campaign against HP. They've had campaigns about, against other groups, the other organizations, other companies that work with Israel that support the Israeli occupation of Palestine. And this is what people need to do. You know, starts by not buying Israeli dates and end up by boycotting uh, big corporations like HP and others who support Israel. How could people of consciousness, I mean, I think every synagogue, church, mosque, you know, should invite you to come on, you know, to go ahead and educate many of the people who are ignorant in this area. Are you open to, are you visiting places, you know, mosques, synagogues, uh, churches? How could people get a hold of you and to learn more? You have a book. Tell us about it. Uh, well, the easiest thing is to send me an email, mikopelet at gmail.com, or send me a message on Facebook. Um, I'm, you know, I'm everywhere. This is, uh, you know, this is the book. The, the General Sun just came out in a second edition, so it's, um, it's, uh, it's got more in it than the first edition does. And so we're very proud that we, you know, it just came out in second edition. Um, uh, it's easy to find me, like I said, on social media or by email. I do speak. I'm happy to speak in, I speak in mosques. I speak in, you know, any form that I'm invited to. And uh, I'm happy to engage in this conversation everywhere and with everyone. There you have it, my friend Miko Pillet. God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us Thank on the Dean Pleasure. Show. Pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in. Subscribe if you haven't already. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you. So.